Hello, and hopefully you can hear me. Hopefully I'm streaming properly here on Ustream. Uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, bright and early. <laughs> Glad to be here. My name is Laurie Ann Smith. This is the Bible study, really. It's looking at biblical counseling. Um, it's a healing word of life. God's word has surely done a great work in me. Let me tell you. I'm a survivor of abuse. Um, sadly enough, uh, you know, horrific abuse as a child. And uh, in my adult life, um, I live abuse-free, which is great. But um, I deal with the aftermath of the abuse and the effects that it had on me in it, in growing up. And um, God's Word really has made all the difference. And so that's why I'm doing the show. So hopefully you can hear me streaming. Um, I'm glad to be back. I haven't been broadcasting for a while. And lots of reasons, just planning a move. As you can see, there's boxes behind me. Um, Things are a little, uh, we've been living out of boxes now for a while because we didn't move. We have, I half packed, packed half of our place, and we're still um, waiting to move. But uh, we've been busy, and my husband is terminally ill, and he's very sick, and he ended up in the hospital a few times. I took a break uh, last September. My, my abuser dad passed away, and at that point, I realized I was so tired. Uh, I'd worked hard all summer to broadcast and to put uh, a website together called Born in Hell, and uh, I realized I needed a break, so I did take a quite a lengthy break there. But I'm glad to be back, and um, this is a little early to be broadcasting. It's really the only time of day that I can actually um, make this work, is in the morning early. Because once my day gets started, it's uh, it's just gone. And so uh, it's better than trying to broadcast at 11 o'clock at night. So I figured, well, I'll just have to get up early and broadcast. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. Glad to be back. And we're going to pick up where we left off. You can grab the last show. Healing Presence Part 1 Continued is the last show that we did. And that was done in um, last September. September 2016. I know where we left off because I keep track of all of this. <laughs> but this is actually from a PDF. This is a, a biblical counseling manual. BCM biblical counseling manual from Adam Pulaski and Steve Lynn. You can find it online by just typing in your browser. Biblical Counseling Manual, Adam Pulaski, P-U-L-A-S-K-I, and it'll come up. And uh, we're on the section that's a, it's a self-acceptance series. It's 13.6, and it's called Healing Presence, Part 1. And we're just halfway through, so we're going to pick up where we left off, and we'll get right into this. It's just, as I said, you can watch the last video if you want to catch up, and uh, any number of my Websites, I have these places around. I have them on YouTube. I have them on Weebly, on their own website, Healing Word of Life. Um, and uh, also, and you can't find it on Born and Hell, but you can find the links there. So, on my website. So, we'll get right into this so healing presence. They were saying that um, I went back and watched that show because I had to see where we were at. Perspective by being different uh, to what we think, we separate ourselves from His presence, from God's presence, right? Casual, casualness is a default into self-consciousness. All fall from God consciousness. Um, becoming persons, the fullness of being evolves as we remain in Christ. And God's word and love is truly something more stern and splendid than mere kindness. This love divides darkness from light, the old self from the new self. So hope is the hope section. Our Lord is not defined in terms of individuality and independence, but in terms of personality. So the Father and I are one, the true self of personality. Man is fully human is to speak of man's fellowship with God and with others. Because evil is separation from God, from self, and from others. To know ourselves in this respect is to begin being healed of the effects of the fall. Remedy is to forsake our horizontal posture. We talked a lot about this on that last video. You can check that out. Looking to the creature instead, straighten up in Christ and seek to meet the needs of others rather than using others solely for our own needs. It is in the state of listening obedience to his commands to bless others, denying self, where we find healing, completion, our true identity. Spiritual and mental wholeness consists simply of obedience, of serving others, of learning to invoke the presence of God. And when God is centered in us and we in him, we have a home within, a true self or center out of which we live. And so that's where we left off. We're picking up the change section here. And they reference uh, James 5.19, Matthew 4.4. 4. He said here, self-centeredness involves seeing yourself walking alongside of yourself. Viewing self as the center of all things which produces self-pity, envy, covetousness, and pride. 
That's interesting. Self-centeredness involves seeing yourself walking alongside of yourself, viewing self as the center of all things, which produces self-pity, envy, covetousness, and pride. I agree with that. You know, I mean, it's a human condition in our fallen state. <laughs> and I don't think we can really get, a, get away from it because originally I believe that, you know, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, God was walking with them before the fall of man. Because I love to study Genesis, and I do a lot of looking in. I, love, I, I spend a lot of time in Genesis, the first few chapters. And I think about that, and I think they must have been fully aware of God, because he was there with them. He created them. He was their creator. Uh, they were covered with his glory, with his spirit. With They, were, they didn't know they were naked. So they, they had no... They had no concept of anything outside this relationship of of God and their of God and, and them together as one, and I think that that must have been amazing. Um, you know, God had put them there to be His co-regents on the earth, and you know, to to fulfill what He had asked them to do. You know, which was to multiply. You know, to to subdue the earth, to, to multiply. So in other words, to be the caretaker on the earth and to be his co-regent reigning with him, right? which we eventually will be doing eventually that because of what Jesus did on the cross. Hallelujah. So self-centeredness now because of our fallen state, you know, we see ourselves walking alongside of ourselves, viewing self as the center of all things, which produces then self-pity, envy, covetousness. It's easy to do because we're, we're stuck in our body, in our fallen mind, and it's easy to fall into that. Um, I guess, I don't know, I, I can't imagine that anybody doesn't think like this. So there might be people on the earth that don't, but I can't imagine. It's a, it's a fallen human condition where we're the center of everything and, and we are then capable of spending, we want to call it copious amounts of time in self-pity, envy, covetousness, all these things that... We are not to do pride, things like this. So it's quite interesting. I agree with what they're saying. Jesus is the new Adam came practicing always the presence of his father. The worship of God is the ultimate denial of the old self and separation. So if you do not practice the presence of God, you will practice the presence of another. So Jesus is the new Adam came practicing always as the presence of his father. And the worship of God, because he came to do the father's work and the father's will. And I think that's... That's what we're to do. If we really are truly abiding in the vine and we're truly in Christ and, you know, we're born again and we, you know, we're in the word and we understand God's word and what his, what his message is to us, we're not going to be thinking of so much of self. And this is the issue that I fight with all the time. And I think it's just, such a, it's something I see other people fighting with too. It's not just because I was abused, you know, uh, because I have all this baggage. Really that I should have let go at the foot of the cross, at Jesus' feet, you know, when I was born again. But I didn't let it go, and I think it was the, uh, to be honest with you, I really don't, it was probably the devil, but first, that 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 too, and also um, just the amount of damage, you know, my mental scarring, scarring on my, on my spirit, on my soul, and on my, my mind, my will, my emotions. Not just physical scars from the abuse, but... The more damaging stuff was what it did to my mind, my will, my emotions. Which, the very core of my being, my spirit, my soul. So, yeah, I did tend to wallow in self-pity. Absolutely. And I also was shown how to do that. You know, when I was growing up, my mother was very, very good at that. <laughs> she did a lot of wallowing in self-pity for her own issues. You know, my mom was abused as a child by her mother. And horrifically, you know, beaten with a horse whipped, you know. And my mom would take the abuse because she was the oldest sibling. She was the oldest born child. And she would put herself in place of her siblings so that she would take the beatings so that her siblings wouldn't have to. But they all were abused, all of my mom's siblings. And my mom did a lot of self-pity, you know, wallowing in that. And, and then married this abusive man then abuse her and her children but she was abusing us too so but self-pity I grew up in that watching that 
that was a learned behavior I knew how to do very well. So by the time I became an adult with my own set of baggage from being abused as a child and in every way, it just was, that was my life, you know. I mean, I could go for periods of time, you know. Uh, this was before I was born again. You know, periods of time in my life where I didn't feel like I was so wounded, you know, so damaged, you know. And then other times, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. The weight of it was so heavy, I couldn't carry it. And I, wanted, I, I at that point, wanted to end my life. Right? People call that self-pity. I call it destruction from being abused so horrifically in every way that it was it was too much for me. Even last night when I was going to bed, I was thinking about that because I sometimes still have suicidal ideation. I never follow through with it. It's just it was part of my life. My parents were suicidal. Two of my brothers killed themselves. And I thought about killing myself for years and years and years. I made a deal with God that I would never do that. More than that, I made a deal with myself that I would never do that. But I still think about it. And, you know, I thought there's that was so scarred into my head. Um, that's, that was my, um, that was my way of salvation, really, was thinking about that. But now I have the Lord, see? So it's easy to fall back into these ruts of old thinking, old behaviors, old ways of dealing with things, old ways of solving things. And if we're going to do it on our own, just like, if we're not worshiping God, we're worshiping another. Which there's only, you're either worshiping the Lord or you're worshiping the devil. One or the other. If we're not serving God, we're serving the devil. It works that way. That is just how it works. We may not want to admit that, but that's the truth. So, you know, these things that just hang around, baggage I call it, just junk. You know, unless I get in touch with what's really going on inside my spirit, inside my my very core of my being, they're going to hang around. These are strongholds. And there is a section we're going to be looking at about strongholds eventually here. There's a whole lot of, this is a huge workbook, 389 page. We just got started. I just keep having to take breaks. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, we're going to keep going. I mean, it's a lot. There's sexual abuse information here. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So we're going to be going through all of that. This is just kind of the beginning section. It was, you know, it's just to get started somewhere in here. It's a huge workbook. And so, you know, I think that's so interesting. You know, these issues of self-pity, envy, covetousness, you know, pride, these have no business with, uh, with, with us as Christians as in Christ. If we're truly in Christ and we abide in the vine, you know, uh, we, ab we abide in Jesus, praise God. We shouldn't be making any room for those because those are of the devil. Uh, Self-pity, envy, covetousness, we're not to do that. Those are things that we should not be doing as Christians. And yeah, you know, fallen man, yeah, I mean, out in the world, yeah, that's gonna, that's the norm for most people. They were envious about somebody or they they want what everybody else has, they're covetous, you know. Pride is a big issue. Pride is a horrible thing. That's why Satan fell, pride. And God hates pride. And pride is not good. I wouldn't say I've got pride. What I've got mainly going on is self-pity. And anger, unforgiveness, that's my the two sort of strongholds in my life. We've got several, several more than that, actually. But those are two really, really horrible ones that I need to get rid of because it's already been paid for. All of that, all of that horror has been paid for because Jesus paid for it, paid sin debt. I need to let it go, man. And it's, uh, it's easier said than done. It's easy to say that. I've forgiven, I've forgiven. You know, I can walk free and, you know, I forgive them as I would like to be forgiven. You know, I've done all that. So these are strongholds, right? And it is, I think it's uh, it's from living in this fallen earth suit that's still, is still here in this fallen world. Even though I've been reborn, recreated, renewed, a new creation unto God. Hallelujah, you know? But... I'm still here in this earth suit, stuck in it with, with the same mind and same memories that I had before. And that's why I think this biblical counseling stuff is very, very important. And a lot of people, you know, I'm kind of, I don't know, not too interested in it, but I'm very interested in it. And um, so we'll just keep on going here. They said here, uh, when we make our will one 
with God, we, we find the integration of personality begins to take place. An identity that God can only give. Review your dependence or need of others. Being controlled by others, you know, like, for instance, mother, father, circumstances of life. Ask God to give you understanding to get at the roots of this idolatry or dependence, of getting a sense of value or worth from created things. Right? That's interesting. When we make our will with one, one with God, we find the integration of, of personality begins to take place, an identity that God can only give. That's true. You know, we are to uh, seek God's will and to be, and to, that should be our focus. That's why unless we get into the word of God, we won't, we won't know his will. <laughs> Just be guessing, right? And this is not going to be helpful. We need to know it. And so I stay in the word all the time. It doesn't mean that I know, know everything. No. <laughs> Nobody knows it all. And there's some people I think that think they know it all, but that's okay. They'll find out that they don't eventually. Right? And if they don't, it doesn't matter anyway. Nobody knows it. Nobody knows it all. Um, but I think, you know, if we love God, keep God first place in our heart, that's that whole horizontal, vertical thing, you know, love God first place, you know, God should be the first place, number one in our life. It should be... That, that's our focus. And then, you know, love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, of course, if we're doing that, and our, putting, and our will is at one with God, as close as we can get it, with daily prayer and seeking Him and spending time with Him, because it takes time. And, you know, a lot of people don't have time, really, or they don't make time. Some people just don't have time, just not to be... I mean, there's no sense in being too hard on people. There's a lot of people out there that really don't have time. Single mothers... Single dads, uh, you know, people that are just so incredibly busy trying to help a loved one or whatever they're doing. And they, they're not going to drop that, you know, so they only have so much time to get into the Bible or maybe they just don't even worry about it. I just make time for the Bible. I used to make 72 hours a week for the Bible. I used to read the Bible 72 hours a week. I used to write it down in time and keep track of my, my, my time in the Word. I did that for the first year. Actually, it was almost two years. And then I got really busy. So now I'm down to however many hours. You know. But I do spend every single spare moment in the Word or some sort of Bible study, some sort of study of God's Word. And it's not enough, even that. We could spend our whole waking life in the Word and we still wouldn't, wouldn't know it all. We wouldn't be able to... We wouldn't be there. We're not going to arrive here in this earth suit. <laughs> But the whole idea is, you know, we're supposed to be we're supposed to be abiding in the vine, reading the word, staying in the word, and and praying and allowing the precious Holy Spirit to move through us. Because if we're a willing vessel for His use, you know, then He can He can move through us. You know, but if we don't, if we're not in the word and we're just doing our own thing and wallowing around in self pity and envy and you know, hatred and whatever else, pride coming out of our hearts and out of our spirits. You know, God can't move in that. <laughs> so it's important, you know, really important to get a hold of these things. <clears throat> and it says, review your review your dependence or need of others being controlled by others, mother, father, circumstances of life. Ask God to give you understanding to get at the roots of this idolatry or dependence, of getting a sense of value or worth from created things. It's kind of interesting. Review your dependence or need of others. Being controlled by others, mother, father. I, th I know, uh, you know, my, my parents were my abusers, so I wanted to get out of, underneath of their control. But I did allow them to remain in my life as an adult because I wanted to help my mom. I was thinking I was doing the right thing by sticking around to help my mother, my mother, who was my main abuser. And um, gave up really a, a lot of my adult life, really. Um... And which they didn't really have much control on me after I, I was an older, you know, late teen, <clears throat> because I could have moved out, you know. But I let them manipulate me, you know, and use me until about the age of 30 when I finally got away from them. But there are people out there I know who struggle with this because their parents were, had such a control on them, I guess, in, in many ways. It could be also with the, uh, uh, control with the intent of protection or love or care. You know, I think I've, I've actually seen stuff like that where parents will 
manipulate their children because they've manipulated them their whole lives and children then don't feel that they can get away from that, that they need to have them around all the time. They can't make a decision on their own without them. You know, I make decisions and I fall, you know, but I've been doing that my whole life because my parents weren't there to help me make decisions. They were there abusing me, but they weren't helping me. <laughs> you know, they weren't in my life to help me. No, they were hurting me and they were hurting everybody in the family and each other. And I was just the last kid bored and it was up to me if I was going to make it or not because no one was going to help me, including my siblings. They did have, my siblings have done a few things for me, but, you know, not much to, because they were screwed, you know, my older siblings. I'm the youngest. And so I don't have that issue going on where someone in my life is, I'm dependent on somebody for, um, you know, be, as being controlled by others. Other father circumstances of life. Circumstances of life I do. So it's not a person controlling me, but the circumstances of life. That issue that is that's you could take you could say that that hits the that hits that hit that just hits the uh, nail on the on the head, you know. Is it control controlled by situations in life? Um, mine is from my past, and it's difficult to get a hold of because this, I was a young girl being abused from birth. So I'm, I'm dealing with the different stages of my life, going, you know, doing this healing work, working through um, these different stages of growth, I guess you want to call it. These inner children, they call it, but actually it's just these points of woundedness that I'm actually dealing with. And uh, circumstances in life, I mean, that I don't have a problem with because I'm used to adversity and I'm used to struggling. My husband's terminally ill. You know, we just live day to day with him because he's always just day to day for the last 16 years. But God is with him, and I know this. See, so I'm just relying on God. But I know this can happen. That people can, you know, allow things or people to control them. So ask, uh, ask God to give you understanding to get at the roots of this idolatry or dependence of getting a sense of value or worth from created things. Do we get a sense of value or worth from created things? I know that I don't. That would be things like just things, whatever it is, your car, your job, um, you know, anything that's a, that's not God from that's not God. <laughs> you know, that that's an idol, and it's it's difficult for us to break down what idols are unless you do some study on it, because we don't go around usually worshiping these little terracotta little or clay formed little things, calling them gods, right? We have other things in our life we, that we don't even call God, but that we're definitely putting before God. You know, they're hard to get a hold of because they're not spelled out in the Bible. Um, different kind of idolatry, but it's the same thing. right? So I think that's really quite interesting, what they have to say here. You know, we need to get our focus on God's will. It says when we make our will one with God, we, we, we find the integration of personality begins to take place. It's an identity that God can only give. And review your dependence or need of others, you know, being controlled by others, mother, father, circumstances of life. Ask God to give you understanding to get at the roots of this idolatry or dependence and of getting a sense of value or worth from created things. That's quite interesting. They uh, reference Philippians 2, 12 through 13. And then they say, allow God to give you favor and success. Learn to bless in the power of the Spirit and to, to collaborate with the Spirit to do the works of Christ. Soul saving is the most creative work in the world. A healed self in Christ is in a position to do the works of Christ, to be a witness of Christ commanded. So that's awesome, you know. Um, God has surely blessed me, you know, like I tell, that's why I do this. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because I want people to know, you know, that someone can come from the pits of hell, literally. And God can transform that person. You know? It can happen. And it's not just me. I've, you know, you see and you hear witness testimonies from people, people who've had horrific lives of drug abuse, you know, whatever it is, prostitution, just on the streets, crime and, you know, murder. And the God works in mysterious ways. Oh, yes, he does. And he, you know, he does a great work saving saving us you know for those i i'm so thankful i'm so thankful that he chased me down at the age of 42 got a hold of me 
because I know that's what it was. He brought me to the very edge of the cliff. He brought me to the he brought me to my knees is what he did. See, because I was abused as a child and I could take it. See. I didn't need God. I was abused as a child physically, sexually, beaten down, you know. But I wasn't a kid hiding in the corner. I just get up and I just keep taking it, taking it, taking it. So God had to bring me to the edge of the abyss and have me hanging off there by a thread for me to wake up and realize that I needed him. And I could not do this on my own. And he didn't want me to do it on my own. He wanted to help me. He wanted to carry the load. He wanted to pay this in debt. He's already been paid. He wanted me to accept it so that I could be saved, so that I, so that I, could, be, so that I could be reborn, recreated, renewed, and have eternal life in the kingdom of God. I'm so glad he chased me down. He brought me to the edge of despair. Absolutely. I know that's what it was. Because I wasn't going to reach out to him. I was just going to keep on trying to do it on my own. Keep taking it. Keep taking it. Just keep going. You know, I mean, I had always been thinking about suicide and killing myself and all this stuff and getting out of my pain, which was really what it was all about. He says, I got another way. Live. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what he said to me. Live. See, that's why I'm doing these shows. Because he can take someone who's at the very edge and given up at the age of eight, nine, ten years old, wanting to be dead. And at the age of 42, sitting around wanting to kill myself with a screwdriver. Thinking I gotta end it, man. There's not, I'm in hell. There's no hope, you know. I may as well be dead, you know. And he, he, he has a different way, you know. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's like live, live. I have the plan. I've got the way. Follow me. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> this is why I'm doing these shows, and I, I hope at some point they're helpful for people. I really do. I'm not doing this for any other purpose except for to show that God could pick up somebody who was, who cursed him and didn't want anything to do with him, but knew that I needed him. <laughs> so I'm going to hell without a Savior. And I love Jesus, and I love God. But I, I, I was so in that blanket of self-pity. I was emerging from the, I was just buried in the, I wouldn't say emerging from the ashes, I was buried in the ashes. From the devil. Evil. Evil work, you know. And he got a hold of me <laughs> right at the edge there when I was ready to go. He's like, don't let go. Yeah. Follow me. Praise God. I am so thankful. So this is why I do what I do. So, yeah, this is great. Uh, this is interesting what they had to say here. So a healed self, a healed self in Christ is in the position to do the works of Christ, to be a witness as Christ commanded, right? So that's the end of this one. We'll pick up 13.7 Healing Presence Part 2 next time. Uh, that'll be in two weeks because I'm going to do these every other week. So every other Monday we'll be doing uh, this particular show, Healing Word of Life, at the same time, 6 o'clock in the morning, God willing. What I want you to do is have a good day. You know, if you need help and you're struggling and you can't cope and things are going down and things are going bad and things are going wrong, I want you to remember my voice. And this person was just talking on U Street. And I really want you to remember that. And I want you to remember that you need to reach out and you need to get some help. You need to get help. If you can't cope and you're struggling... There are, God works through so many people. There are people out there who can help you, but you have to reach out. You have to do that. You have to make the decision to reach out. And then call upon him. Call upon his name. But reach out at the same time. And do not struggle on your own. Whether it's biblical, biblical help, biblical counseling, whether it's secular, you know, secular help, doesn't matter. Just reach out and get some help. And God bless you all. Until the next time.